So listening actually to Jane earlier, I was reflecting on my own journey into social work before I started my social work degree, which was at the University of Washington in Seattle. I had been working on the Navajo Nation and I had this very visceral memory of sitting around the kitchen table. I was working in a domestic violence organization and we spent a lot of hours eating sunflower seeds. And I'm pretty sure that's an indigenous practice. Um, and it was a way I think to support each other because the work was really hard um, and also make light. So we mostly were teasing each other who could crack more seeds. And um, so I, I say that because I really want to recall how central um, indigenous community and knowledge and ways have been to my own education as a settler living in the United States and now Canada. And I don't think I'm always aware of how central it has been. And so along that journey, I had a chance to meet Michael Yellowbird. We were both teaching at the University of Kansas at the time. Um, and I have been a big fan following Michael, your work for many years, how you've been a leader in creating spaces for indigenous youth and teaching indigenous knowledges in the academy, but also working with um, fostering indigenous practices, recovering knowledges that have been there, but often people were not able to have deep awareness of because of the violence of colonization. And then um, through the publication of this book, uh, got to know Chris Clark, the work, and the, the work you all have done together in creating workshops um, to help people build this collective knowledge on healing. So I just wanted to invite each of you to introduce yourselves, however you'd like, and also how you came to work with each other. Well, I first uh, just like to say um, thank you so much, uh, Pauline, for organizing this and for all the participants who are here today. Uh, thank you, um, Jane, um, for the, those really wonderful opening remarks and, and to the opening song. It was a beautiful opening song. I'm here located on Treaty One territory in Manitoba, Manitoba um, and uh, it's really a great place to be right now. <clears throat> I am actually um, uh, a member of the three affiliated tribes: the Mandan, Hiradza, and Rikara, and um, I am a, vis a visitor to this, to this part of the world. So um, although our, there was no border before, so our tribes um, uh, were traditional horticulturalists, agriculturalist tribes traded a lot with uh, the Cree and the Dakotas and the Ojibwe people, all came down to our territory to uh, purchase to our markets. We had the, all these markets where uh, you mentioned sunflowers, we grew sunflowers. Uh, potatoes, uh, all kinds of corn and beans and squash. So we were, um, uh, we traded that. And of course, people up north here bring down hides and furs and all kinds of, you know, uh, dried moose meat, all these different kinds of things. So there was a very vibrant world that I, that I came from at one time before colonization. So um, I'll, I'll just say that much as an opener, so as an introduction. Thank you all very much and thank you for the wonderful introduction. This is kind of my first experience with Canada. So um, it's, it's really nice to hear uh, about your center. It sounds so very important and I'm very honored to be invited here. I'm speaking to you from uh, Finland, um, which the Northern part of Finland is Sami territory, which stretches across Russia, what is nowadays uh, part of Russia, Norway and Sweden. Uh, but I'm originally from uh, the Central Valley of, of California, which is the traditional homeland of the Yokuts, Mono, and Dachi tribes. I'm an Irish uh, Norwegian background. Um, I've been an immigrant for about 20, 25 years uh, in Finland, but I've also lived back and forth uh, between the two countries. Um, Sunflower seeds were a big part of my childhood as well, which is why I had to kind of pipe up about that. It was kind of a collective thing when we would go to ball games and things that we always sat in the stands with the crowd and, you know, uh, enjoyed that. And those were really communal times. Uh, when I think of uh, West Fresno, the area where my father was a football coach, um, where everybody, a very that we the community was very diverse, came together. Um, and it was a really nice moment of, of kind of uh, common, common gathering, uh, which, which is that connection that we, we do need. 
So I'll stop there. I'm sure um, you have you have questions. So yeah. Well, the, you know, reading parts of your book, I didn't get to read it. Like I didn't get to do the old fashioned thing where you sit and open a book because I think I was looking at it on the computer, which is not the same. I have to get the actual book. But um, the way you wrote the book was a conversation between the two of you. And I'm just curious, how did you all get this started? What is this collective work? Um, what does it look like? Because I, I understand you both have long commitments to wrestling with the colonial violence within social work and how to you know, chart a path forward. Um, so I'm curious, where did it all start for you all? I think it was breakfast in Vermont, actually, because I, I think I opened a door at a conference and kind of fell over Michael. And I apologized and said, well, look, I'm going for breakfast. Why don't you join me? You know, I had a rental car. And uh, I think we ended up having breakfast for three hours talking about uh, these different issues and missed a large part of the conference. But for me, it was very eye-opening because I just want to say, you know, having grown up as a settler um, in California, where I, I really had very minimal exposure to ideas of uh, settler colonialism, um, uh, colonizing social work was something I, I really had never heard about. Uh, what I had learned of colonialism was that it was something far away, it was something that the British Empire did in Africa or something like this. Um, and yet working in social work, you know, my father was someone who was uh, in an orphanage for a number of years and, and lived with in kinship care. My family had a lot of foster kids. So we had contact with, with social work quite a bit, but I, I had very mixed feelings and sort of a distressed feeling about social work, but I had no words or understanding of why. I, I, I didn't know how to analyze it. So this com first conversation for me was very important in, in kind of opening up a new world uh, that I, I really hadn't thought about. Yeah, that's uh, the same story. Uh, um, I think what, what before Chris and I had met, what, what really informed me as I talk about in the book was uh, a mentor uh, Ron, Ronald G. Lewis, who was uh, the first um, Native professor that I had in my graduate studies. And this is way back when, in, in the late 70s. Uh, he was, I was doing my MSW, and he was uh, one of my professors. And he was the first person that really introduced me to uh, the concept of colonization in social work. In fact, he's written about it. And, uh, you know, colonialism, just like Chris, you know, it's, it's kind of hidden from the American narrative and the agenda. It's just something that, you know, people came and discovered this empty land and they civilized it and they built this, you know, civilization, right, this empire. And um, it's through manifest destiny and the help of God, you know, this white Christian God. And, and so I, I grew up on a reservation for most of my life. And um, I would talk about that in the book, you know, the things I experienced in terms of the hardship as well as the beauty and the strengths that we, that we had on the reservation. I mean, we, we were at the same time going through these dramatic transformations, uh, you know, taking away language and culture and identity, but yet uh, underground hanging onto a number of these kinds of things. So uh, after I met Ron and he uh, was at Wounded Knee, he was also at Alcatraz Island in the late 60s. He was part of that whole movement, you know, of, of uh, uh, AIM people, American Indian movement people that maybe, I don't know if young people study that enough. That's really uh, an important, it's really an important part of our history where, you know, you had the, uh, the uh, brotherhood here in Canada with George Manuel, and, and it was very similar. If it wasn't for people like that, people like me would have never been in the academy mm -hmm. because they started these uh, native studies programs and we, and we were finally bringing uh, Native people into social work because of all this horrendous uh, history of removing kids and, and you know, uh, just all this uh, policing and, uh, that was going on. So when I met Chris, you know, we, had, we started having this conversation about this stuff and I was kind of telling her my experience and, and, and what I had learned uh, way through that. And, and we really resonated and she was very, uh, very open to that, as well as, you know, she had, as you, if you read the book, she has her own story about being marginalized in so many different kinds of ways. So uh, we just really hit it off and we spoke the same language. Um, 
Um, and, and we were both really, I think, um, I guess, committed to, to uh, working together in some way um, to kind of do, uh, to, to transform, you know, social work. Mm -hmm. So we, we started with those kinds of ideas uh, about, you know, what kinds of things were happening. And, and then, you know, it kind of, in the book, it, it, you know, is really revealing. I think we really kind of dug into the, into the, um, the, the dark side of, of social work and looked at, looked at that, you know, and, and to kind of think, well, okay, we got into this uh, social work and now what, right? Years ago, I, I, I wrote a story about this, uh, published it, but it's uh, when I was, uh, when um, Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, social workers came into my house and removed kids. We talked about that. And I remember uh, uh, my, talking to my mother a few years ago and she said, yeah, I always wondered why you ever wanted to be a social worker. She said, you know, because of all the um, horrible things that had happened, you know, to our people from social work. So um, Chris and I shared these stories. So I, that was kind of like how we start opening up this um, really big interest that we had together to kind of uh, uh, contribute, I guess, to the liberation of, of, of uh, you know, the truth about what social work, or what social work is about. And then what potential we had people to kind of help work with others to transform, so. I'm wondering like that, the, the work of the dark side of social work, I feel like we could spend hours just talking there, but in a way I, I wish, I would like to hear more about the, the practices that you um, uncovered or you were bringing together. Um, in conversation with Chris, I was healing, um, it sounds like the, there are many workshops that you all co-hosted tapping into healing practices, some of which show up in the book. What, what does it look like from that vantage point of bringing people together? What were the kind of lessons you learned um, from these healing practices? And, and I guess even for myself as a social work educator, where do they belong in our social work training or practice? Well, we, said, we, we started having what we called like decolonizing retreats in Fresno, California. And, and the model of doing them was we, we would have no money, no grant money, we would behold, be beholden unto nobody. And it would all be done with community, you know, people participating, somebody like Michael would stay at my house and, you know, people would host other people at their homes and someone would donate food. And, you know, we, we really tried to work, work in that way. And I think just developing that kind of a model of you know, people really wanted to talk about these issues and they found no, no venue for this. There was no spot for this. And there was a great willingness to come together as, as activists, as community members, as social workers, as students, people had a great variety of roles. And we would do different things like um, theater of the oppressed or drumming, uh, talking circles, different, different uh ways to get people connected, but also I think one of the main outcomes that, that came from, from these, these events, and they were held, like I say, I think once a year for five years, was that people developed permanent ties, you know, so that they had also support systems and, and people that they could go to, you know, when they, when they had dark times or struggles with, with uh, work. So the healing practices you know, were maintained by people after the after the events, and and the dialogues continued. I mean, Fresno right now is is an area where there's a lot of activism, and a lot of the people who are in our our workshops are really driving forces. And I think that that synergy that people had in coming together, you know, helped drive them to uh, um, to also you know seeing beyond and and getting energy from each other. Yeah, and just to kind of, again, follow up with that, I think that was a very brilliant idea. And that was Chris's idea to, to hold these decolonization um, workshops, seminars, or retreats, um, because it really gave folks an opportunity to talk about, you know, um, what were some of the um, biggest challenges in being a social worker, right? And what is the system, uh, systemic racism? I mean, you're, you're describing social work, you know, because of you know everything we know is, is 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 about that, and only more recently have we gotten alternatives to some of the systemic racism in, in, in social work. For example, as scholars, you know we're able to publish. We don't have to publish in the mainstream uh, journals 
that will that will you know single you out because um, you know the ideas you have may be too radical or untested or not empirical. But you can find indigenous journals or um, journals that you know invite this kind of dialogue and discourse. So that's one thing, right? And then, and and so we we had these conversations about the academy, about the the whole operation of social work, and of course in, into the dark past of social work. Um, um, you know, social work is, you know, a profession that was founded under um, under white Christian supremacy, period. And that's just what early social work was all about. It was about religious groups, about uh, religious social organizations, and. Uh, Clergy leaders, you know, um, just like the Salvation Army, you you don't you can't have a bite until you you say, you know, you thank God for for this, right? So it's, it was just the same way of co-opting Native people into in, into Christian religions. So it was used. Uh, so Christianity was used as a tool of oppression, and social work used that well. And so that's the whole undergirding and the, the uh, subtext of social work. Uh, I mean, when you get back to Hall House, Jane Adams, that I mean, that's the mother of social work. Look at Hall House and how Hall House used to uh, prohibit black people from being in Hall House. They couldn't be in. They couldn't be in that, you know, unless it was all full. Uh, unless they couldn't fill it to capacity with white people. That is the most early. And, and, and of course, these are Christians, right? This is the earliest sort of um, uh, level of racism that's happening in social work and in the marginalization of people. And of course, it's all it's all been aimed at the marginalization, and you know, um, it's never really been aimed at challenging white supremacy. It's mm -hmm. been only, uh, you know, mostly uh, now more recently anti-racism, which is very different than white supremacy challenge, right? So just don't be racist to these people. But it's that's not dismantling these white racist structures, and that's what we took on in the book. Mm -hmm. We talked about how that was a huge part of that. And then in these conversations, we listened to students. And then, of course, Chris and I were talking about it late at night, you know, at her house in, in, uh, or over lunch or breakfast or whatever. And, uh, and, and starting to formulate these ideas that we talk about in the book. Yeah, and a big part of, you know, what was important was, was I think for both of us, was writing it in a way that it was accessible to people and wouldn't be you know, so so difficult to, or a specialized language that, that it wouldn't be accessible to people because I think we both wanted to, to reach out and, and, you know, also to reflect, as Michael said, these, these dialogues that we've been having with people. So, so the writing of it, I think we were both trying to be very conscious of, of being clear and open so that anybody could pick that up and, and find something in it, that it wasn't only going to be for a small circle of people. Yeah, I mean, I think Chris did a great job on, on the story that she did about one of the workers on the uh, suicide hotline. I mean, if that isn't like, you know, sweatshop labor, you know, and abuse of, of social workers, um, I mean, you just take a look at that, how the system just sort of just saps them you know, uses them up until they quit because they can't go anymore or in child welfare. I mean, these are, these are the things that we you know that are, that are pretty clear to us that that's what's happening in social work. And, and of course, you know, it calls for major structural reform um, for that. So anyway, yeah, so there's a lot of stories that we have in the book, so. I have to say that my, my favorite story actually was your story about water. Because when I first read it, I read it very superficially and I thought, you know, What's he on about? Like, what is this talking about? But when I read it like the second time, I mean, I think it's a very profound story. You have to take your time with it and, and think about it. But I think that this just reflects also the settler, the colonial mindset that, that is so deeply instilled from childhood in us, you know, the white supremacist colonial mindset is I kept expecting when I read that story that this water was gonna do something, it's gonna heal, like, what's it gonna do? You know, what's, where's the data? What's the, you know, and, and actually what, what's profound about it is that sense of connection, which is something we don't learn. That's, that's why we also started the book with talking about how are we on this earth? How, how do we exist here? How do we see our existence? How do we think we know things? 
And then how do we act? Because there is a difference, you know, and, and I noticed it with the, reading the water story because yeah, it just, it went over my head the first time because I, I wasn't used to thinking in that way. But when I read it the second time, I think to me, that's the most deeply philosophical story that really encapsulates everything, which is why it's great that it's like one of the first stories as we talk about those elements, because that's really what it's about. It's about the connection. If the water's not well, we are not well. Yeah. It's, 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 the story, you know, um, is, is really not my story. I'm just a kind of a messenger of the story because this is a story that many indigenous people tell about you know, that water is life. I mean, talk about a bit about, you know, um, Standing Rock, of course, in, in the big fight there, um, resistance to uh, corporate, you know, uh, influence in politics, you know, trying to build this pipeline and all these pipelines that are happening. And um, thank you. You know, thank the creator, there are people there that are mindful to understand that we need clean water, mm -hmm. you know, and, and water is not just a commodity, but it's life, right? Mm -hmm. And so, as I told a story, um, one of the things was then, I go back to Ron Lewis, you know, in, in the parking lot at, at um, uh, Uni University of Milwaukee, uh, you know, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, at um, Helen Bader um, School of Social Work out in the parking lot. So he's telling me you're going to graduate all this stuff, you know, and, and he tells me, he said, you know, um, you know, Michael he said, you go back home. He said, you, you can't just start another social service program and hang eagle feathers on it and call it, uh, you know, indigenous social work. He said, you, you can't just hang, you have to uh, draw from, you know, the knowledge of your people. And so that's how the story ended, you know, we kind of moved in that direction where my uh, aunt, I call her grandma Grace, but She's really my aunt, but my son's called her Grandma Grace, came and, and talked about it and then said, you know, in the, in the very end, maybe uh, that your, your, uh, what, your, what your professor was talking about was this, keep hanging on to your tradition. So she took me down to the waters, did this ceremony over the water and um, told me what it was all about. Of course, I had heard that before, but I think when, 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 when it catches you at that right time, you know, mm -hmm. And, and the story is told in this particular way, and it's demonstrated with you know using these medicines and this language. It's very profound. You know, it's and again, it's not my story. I, I just I was just lucky enough to be there to kind of uh, uh, say what she said. So I think that's what we try to do with the book. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm wondering as I'm listening, where do these stories, where does developing a relationship with water fit into social work? And I'm trying to imagine, I've recently been reading Robin Kimmerer's work, um, who, you know, makes a challenge for us to not just learn from water, but give mm -hmm. and be of service to. And I'm wondering, what would social work look like if it is not just taking care of water, but also offering um, to support the water. I don't know, does that fit into social work, Michael and Chris? Where do you see the potential for our, our training? Because I work with many social work students who are eager to learn, but also are anxious about getting a job. And our capitalist system, as you were saying, Chris, you were holding these workshops and not taking money, mm -hmm. as I imagine as a defense to protect the space from capitalist interest, um, and maybe I don't want to be too cynical, but help me understand where might be some promising ways this can be integrated, or are there some things that should not be integrated into Western social work? Well, perhaps you you have, you know, in terms of work, like maybe going even outside of the technical role of a social worker. I, you know, I come from an area where the, the water is very polluted, where the air is very polluted. Um, I don't live there anymore, but but in the Central Valley. Uh, so I think a lot of people have turned a lot of people have turned activism to to issues of land use, uh, fighting for environmental justice um, is a very important way. But it you know it, I think you're right. It ha it's not enough to play defense. You know uh, there there has to be something more than just trying to, to fight the relentless trek of, of capitalism. It's, you know, um, 
and and that's you know in, in with this book you know we wrote this book also as as a for discussion in community you know that that's why there's questions at the end to to try to, I'm not I don't think either one of us would claim to have all the answers but to try to provoke people in different places to to discuss and and in our last chapter that's why it's about futurity about you know we know what has to happen for us to to survive as a species on this planet so the question i think we have now is like how do we how do we do that you know how do we find these ways you know and i think everywhere in the world people are scrambling to try to find what what are these ways to add to that too, I think um, I know a little bit about Jane, uh, Jane's work in trauma. And I think it, it's, it's the same, you know, that we, uh, the story that I told about how uh, my, my son's um, grandfather had healed this horse, healed my son in the, in the ground. You know, he was saying that, you know, trauma can, be, can extend itself to all these things that we don't think are alive. Mm -hmm. And so when he did the ceremony, when my son got thrown from the horse, there's a ceremony we do back on the plains, right? So he did the ceremony with my son. And then I thought, okay, he's done. No, so we got to go do the horse now. So then he did the horse and we we're, you know, waiting there. I said, okay, now he's done. We're going to give him these gifts. And there's no, nope, we're not done. So then he had to do the ceremony over where the incident happened to the leaves, the trees. And um, my, my uh, colonized mind, you know, I'm like, oh, when's he going to get done? But then of course, I had grown up with that, you know, so my mind was kind of fighting back and forth. And I said, okay, this is exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about, we don't take our time, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you ask about that, what can social work do? I think social work really has to take that very seriously about their curricula, right? There should be a strong curriculum in land-based, water-based education. I mean, that's gotta be the centerpiece I think of any kind of uh, social work uh, program, because we're in, we're in such a state that we we have grown so far away from the land and the water that now we live in this very very uh, you know precarious place. We're you know, we're, we're, in, we're at the margins you know of what ecologists call overshoot and collapse. We overshot the Earth's capacity to take care of us because we've polluted it so much and we've destroyed it so much that you know we're in a state of collapse. And that's what we talk about, you know, in this in this book is that unless if we can continue to do the things we continue to do as social workers, we're not going to get it. So we know water is a healer. We know water is a healer. Just like the whole I just had a conversation with, with a bunch of mindfulness people um, just a few days ago talking about forest therapy, the forest bathing. And I listened. I said, this is Japanese. And guess what? It's good for you to be out in nature. Mm -hmm. Right. There's evidence based for it now. I'm like, and I sat there, I, was, I had a hard time holding my tongue, but then I, then I said, listen, you know, this is what indigenous people have been saying forever. It's important to be out there. This was the whole colonization process, the colonization of your movement and your ability to be out there where you belong, out in nature, out on the land, in the water, in the mountains, in the desert, on the plains, you know, in the, in the, in the Arctic, wherever your people are from. And, and I think that's what we, uh, that's not taught. It's like the Rwandans after the Rwandan genocide, all these Western mental health counselors went to Rwanda and, and the Rwandan the villages throw these people out. They, they threw them out because they said, all these Westerners want to do is they want to take us into these dark dingy rooms and talk to us for hours about what happened. You know, and we, we believe that you can cast trauma out of your body just like you can cast out an evil spirit and you do that by dancing by singing being outside in the sun so we had to send these westerners away because they they don't know how to heal so that's a, that's a very famous story you know that 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 you know we have to remember that that's what's happening with social work social work has lost its connection maybe never had a connection really to to uh, to the earth right we started on the streets in, in an urban area where is indigenous people social work started on the land, on the waters, in the mountains. So, uh, you know, and, and so I think that's, that's the difference. If you can get Western social work to begin to shift their paradigm toward a, a more indigenous orientation, then maybe there's a chance, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the stories in, in the book is about, you know, I went up to Sami territory here once and spent a few weeks with uh, Sami social workers 
and they there's a they had a group of men who had, who had, had issues with alcohol and there's a beautiful clinic maybe i don't know six hours away by bus the top state-of-the-art great clinic uh, when they send people there they come back they relapse pretty quickly so these two sami women created what's what they call in in Finnish metsa therapy, so uh, forest therapy, but a different kind of focus. They took these guys out on the um, a canoe, out on an island to do things like they would do traditionally with Sami people, uh, hunting, fishing, you know, reconnecting back to roots, reconnect, speaking Sami, doing the things that uh, were kind of not banned, but difficult to do because capitalism had come and it was hard to be a reindeer herder the way it was in, in previous generations. So way of life had been kind of uh, uh, squashed. And, and you know what? They had a much better uh, rate of people staying sober and doing well than, than the people who went to the beautiful clinic. And this was low tech. These the women went and, you know, this was very basic stuff. You know, they went and stayed in an average cottage. Um, so it's not always like data-driven, high-tech, all this kind of stuff. It's sometimes just going back to recognizing your roots. It also connects people not only with the earth, but with each other. And that's what you need. I mean, addiction is a, a disease of disconnection, right? And, you know, th this was just the, the best medicine in a way. The same is true about that. Uh, there's really interesting... Um research that went on with uh, Aboriginal people in Australia, went out to the outback. They were suffering from all these chronic uh, uh, diseases, morbidities from uh, hypertension and, and alcohol abuse and, and uh, uh, heart disease and, and high blood pressure, all these things. Put them out and, and it's very, you can find it, you know, um, the research, put them out in the bush for a few weeks, all those markers went down and, and they started thriving and doing better. So this is the thing with indigenous people, they were taken from their, their places of thriving, you know, into places where, you know, the body says decay, decay. Um, it's not like we're, we were never equipped to have, you know, um, um, treatment um, approaches or interventions for trauma. We did as indigenous people. And we've had, we've had things that have been even more difficult than residential schools, you know, like climate change, like, you know, smallpox that wiped out my people. And how do we come back from that and not, you know, get, get uh, caught in this, this never ending door of, of historical trauma? Well, we know now that it's not people, it's the system that has continued to perpetuate the trauma and people can't get away from the trauma. In the past, people could do the ceremonies and they could heal all kinds of traumas, whatever those traumas were. They, they, you know, they survived ice ages, they survived, you know, um, droughts, famines, all those kinds of things. And they did it on the land. They did it with the resources and the connection, reconnecting people with the land, whether it was hot or cold environments or whether it was, um, you know, uh, in certain very uh, sacred places where people went to pray or went to uh, fast or found meaning again and, re and got back to their set point who they were as indigenous people, you know, we don't do that now. There's the, all the sacred places have been plowed up and paved over, or they're now parks and you can't get in there, you know, because they were taken away from indigenous people and colonized in that way. So those are the things social workers could fight for us for the, you know, to, to restore those places for healing. So. And I think um, I'm going to switch. I want to open the floor if folks want to write some questions in the chat. Um, we can take one or two questions before we take a break. Um, one of the things I was reflecting on as you all were speaking, one like one of the paradigm shifts for social work today, at least where I work, is to let go of the evidence-based practice um, as the only criteria to guide us forward. Because even though, Michael, you were saying there is emerging evidence of, on these like long lasting indigenous knowledges, like being in, in nature is healing, is not new, but now maybe there's no new science to show us um, how it enhances health and well being, but it may require us to have faith to create land based pedagogies 
um, even without maybe scientific proof or evidence to show. I think that will be a huge paradigm shift for many programs. Um, but I also was reflecting on before the pandemic, although it's hard to remember now, life before the pandemic, I was so grateful in witnessing and participating. There was incredible organizing happening across Turtle Island um, in solidarity with Wet'suwet'en community in particular, um, with Standing Rock, the, the kind of collective sharing of indigenous knowledges. I, I just felt like I was partially witness to. And even this incredible youth whose name I don't recall, they were speaking in Toronto at a rally. They were having rallies every week. Like this was incredible. The momentum amongst many young people, driven really by many young people, including indigenous leaders. And this young person was um, inviting us to have a relationship with any tree. Mm -hmm. And it was great because those of us in an urban landscape, as you were saying, Michael, so much of the natural world has been devastated by human um, consumption. But they were suggesting, and I think it's been quite powerful, that just committing to one tree can be transformative. It can get us to a place. And this was just sitting with the tree 30 minutes a day, noticing, developing a relationship with it, caring for it. Maybe it's not a tree. Maybe it's a bush. Maybe it's a plant. Um, but it could start somewhere small and hopefully grow. These are just some things I was reflecting, but I'd love to invite my colleague, Ashley. Perhaps you can let us know what questions have been coming up in the chat. Yeah, we've had a lot of uh, great feedback, um, a lot of validation about um, especially carrying knowledge and living in between different worlds. And uh, so many of us are working towards the same um, solutions and the same goals, but where do we draw the line between appropriation um, and 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 non-appropriation? And and we we hear a lot about adapting things, adapting things towards an indigenous framework. But what I hear a lot too is that uh, indigenous there are indigenous ways of knowing and research and um, of being, and so when will these be at this at the table at the same way instead of being adapted or modified for um, mainstream purposes? When how do we move towards that as social workers? Maybe I can I can help with that. Um, I think we have to. What's important if you think about traditional people, I'm not talking about people that are 100 years old today. I'm talking about people that probably about four or 500 or maybe a thousand years old today that would be indigenous people. Uh, when uh, when uh, Rupalim mentioned um, Cahokia, if you know of what Cahokia is, Cahokia was a trade center, it was a crossroads of indigenous people. So indigenous people we know now from Cahokia to the um, Medicine Wheel in the Bighorn Mountains in Wyoming, indigenous people have been congregating and gathering and sharing ideas, ceremonies, technologies, you know, material, ideas, whatever. Um, and they've always done that, I think, um, with one another, because they believe, many believe that, of course, you know, they would, it would help their society. So I think that's the thing, is that um, it, it's important, I think, there are some things I think that uh, of indigenous knowledge that you know non-indigenous people can benefit from. Um, part of the problem is that sometimes when they get it, then they turn it into a commodity and start you know trying to sell it. And that's that's where the bad part happens. So sharing information, I think, is really important. You can't. It's really difficult. I mean, people have these profound um, changes when they do forest bathing when they go out, like Rupaline was talking about, where they go out and sit with a tree or a plant. We know why, you know, from neuroscience, we know why from a spiritual point of view. One of the things that happens with people when they're around uh, trees for a long time, uh, their brain begins to conform neural pathways with the connection of the shape of the trees, the smell of the trees, all these systems all work together. Then we know, like with my tribal people way back in the day, um, when they used to sing to a, a tree that represented a mother or grandmother for long periods of time, what happened in their brain was the parietal lobe and the brain got quiet. There was no longer this space between the tree and them. They became the tree. The tree became them. They became the roots, the bark, the leaves, the smell. We know how that works in neuroscience today. We know that's why indigenous people done that. 
And we know that's why all people have done that to, to find a, a, a level of uh, transcendence of being human being to connect with the other part of the world. I mean, all the great spiritual leaders have done that. So that's not a secret. It's just that it's a long path to doing that. People have just taken that and commodified it on a weekend and said, let's go have a, we're going to have this thing with the tree and then we're going to, you're going to feel better about that. It's going to cost you 5,000 bucks a piece to do that, right? So people are hungry for that spirituality, very hungry for it. So it's, it's um, that idea like, you know, that happened in the 90s. You know, I, in the 90s, people were, uh, they were calling a lot of indigenous people um, pl plastic medicine men because they were sharing a lot of our ceremonies. I don't know, you, most of you probably don't even remember that. You're probably not even born then, but that in the 90s, that's what was going on, you know, and there are people writing a lot of articles about that. But then there were some um, 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 spiritual leaders said, no, this is a good thing. You know, this is our younger brother, our younger sister. We have to teach them. If they don't know this, how are they ever going to learn, right? And so I think it, it, that's where the, the history of all this comes from. I think it needs to be looked at in, in a really large kind of way to kind of find out if you teach people something sacred about the land, you know, is it going to, are we going to be better off or worse off about that? That's, that's the question. So I don't have an answer, but I'm just saying that's, you know, this is what people have said.